Welcome to Faith Lutheran Church. Today is, of course, Good Friday, and we're going to spend time at the foot of the cross, which gives us an opportunity to meditate on the suffering of Christ for our sin and his payment thereof. Just a word with regard to the prayers this morning and the reproaches. The bidding prayer is the traditional prayer used on Good Friday. It's a prayer of the church that has been used for centuries now on Good Friday, and it encompasses many different requests, many petitions, all of which seek to attempt to ask God for all the things that the world needs. And it has changed over the course of years, but there are some central themes that you'll pick up quickly. In our prayers this morning, we will be praying for all of our people who are ill, but namely two people who've come to my attention in the last week or so. First of all, Cesar. Um, and you all know Cesar. He gives us the bulletins all the time. Um, he's just experiencing some illness now, and so we want to pray for him. Also, some of you may know or may not know yet that George Walter now has been admitted to the palliative care unit at St. Paul's Hospital. I was able to see him earlier this week, had prayers with him and two of his family. Um, in the course of that discussion, I sought and received their permission to share all of this with you. In addition, they made one other request. We all know how much you would like to visit him, um, but at this time, the family has requested me to ask you to simply include him in your prayers and refrain from visiting as much as you would like to do so. All right. <clears throat> Let us pray. Almighty God, graciously behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men to suffer death upon the cross. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our worship continues with the reading from Isaiah. Good Friday is from Isaiah chapters 52 and 53. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted, as many were astonished at you. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. And for that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter 
and like a sheep that before it shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for sin. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Merciful and everlasting God, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all to bear our sins on the cross. Grant that our hearts may be so fixed with steadfast faith in him that we fear not the power of sin, death, and the devil. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The epistle is from Hebrews chapters 4 and 5. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our comp confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that may re we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you willed that your Son should bear for us the pains of the cross, and so remove from us the power of the adversary. Help us so to remember and give thanks for our Lord's passion, that we may receive forgiveness of sin and redemption from everlasting death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as we sing verse 1 of Jesus I Will Ponder Now. may be seated. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. 
So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, then let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Please stand as we sing our next hymn. be seated. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. And they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? And those who have heard me, what I said to them, they know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, 
a relative of the man whose ear Peter cut, cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Please stand for our next song, hymn. Please be seated. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not answer, they did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. Then Jesus said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. My servants would have been, is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back inside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Please stand as we sing the next verse. Please be seated. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, 
See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out. Wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him out yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he had made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it was given to you from above. Therefore he who delivered me over to you as the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat as a at a place called the Stone Pavement, one in, Ara in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. We sing our next hymn, Please Stand. Please be seated. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. <coughs> Pardon me. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews told Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts. One part for each soldier, also his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, 
but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. Please stand as we sing the next hymn. <clears throat> be seated. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and his disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. We join together in singing, O sacred head now wounded. Please. seated. Since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you may also believe. For these things took place, that this scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, They will look on him whom they have pierced. And these things, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 70 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, 
there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Please stand as we sing our next verse. Christ's mercy and God's peace be unto you in the name of the suffering servant Jesus. The text this morning is taken from Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 7. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hid their, hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. This is our text. Please be seated. Dear baptized members of the family of God here at Faith, in a world that is driven by marketing and fixated on entertainment, you must admit that Good Friday seems a little bit out of step. There is nothing entertaining about the cross, and there's no way to draw a smiley face on the crucifixion. No matter how you slice it, slice it, there is just no way to sell the cross. And there is truly nothing entertaining about this day. But then that is the way it should be. This day is not called Happy Friday, but after all, Good Friday. God the Son did not come down from heaven to make us happy. He was not incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, to make us happy. He was not made human and crucified for us under Pontius Pilate to make us happy. It was not to make us happy that he suffered and was buried or on the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. Jesus Christ is interested in so much more than our mere happiness. His burning intent is nothing less than our eternal joy. Our Lord Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame for the one joy that was set before him, that he might swallow up in death forever in his death. And he did this, though it meant that he had to set aside his glory and embrace our own human shame for all of it. All this and so much more puts the good into Good Friday. Jesus, the Lamb of God, pure and holy, bears our shame. That's what was going on that very first Good Friday. Although he is in himself pure and holy, 
Jesus was carrying all our shame in that pure and holy body of his that day. That's why, that is why he looked so bad on the day we call good. Now, you all know the events of Good Friday very well. It was not a happy scene that day. The holy prophet Isaiah records that he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. This sums up the way things played out that very first Good Friday when Christ Jesus, the sinless Son of God, took on the sin of the world and died a sinner's death under the wrath and judgment of God, his righteous Father. It looked for all the world like Jesus was the worst sinner who ever lived or who would ever live. <clears throat> Isaiah says it this way, We consider him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. It looked as though Jesus deserved to die. Otherwise, you tell me, why would God be punishing him? So we learn an important lesson this day. We learn to look for God not in external circumstances, but hidden as always in the kingdom of God, under the opposite. He reveals his glory in his shame, his joy in sorrow, his comfort wrapped in suffering and pain. For things were not as they appeared that Good Friday. It looked as though Jesus was stricken and smitten by God because of his own sin, when in reality it was our sin that hurt him so. This the prophet underscores in these words. We considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. For you see, at the cross, amid great agony of body and soul, the Son of God opened up the heart of God, for the whole world to see. Things were not what they appeared to be. Hidden under the agony of Christ and his excruciating suffering, we can see the Father's love in action. Not one of us would give up his son or daughter to save another. But at the cross, God the Father sacrificed his son his only son, the son whom he loved to remove the curse of sin. At the cross, the Lamb of God, stripped and mocked and flogged, was carrying in himself the full burden of all the sins of all the world. No wonder then that he was pierced and crushed. For there Jesus, the sinless Lamb of God, got what not he deserved, but what we deserved. The cross, justice was done, but not as it seemed. Jesus was indeed stricken and afflicted by God, but not on account of anything he himself had done. Rather, it was our sin, yours and mine, that he was carrying on his sinless back that pure and holy Lamb of God, and there he bore our shame as well. So, it's Good Friday. The question we must ask is, Jesus died for our sins, right? Yes, he did. If Pilate can ask, what is truth? Let us take a moment and ask, what is sin? Sin is rebellion, idolatry, it's taking yourself 
and worshiping all the things that you hold dear that are sinful and putting them on, on the altar and taking Jesus and God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit away. It is open hostility against the God who in love created us and gave us all that we have, who purchased and won for us and won us by the blood of Jesus, who called us by his spirit through the gospel. Violations of his will, therefore, bring not merely guilt, but shame as well. We've all known the ravages of shame. That sense of being and feeling dirty and filthy, contaminated by things that fill you with remorse and regret. Things that you have thought and said and done that leave you utterly broken, humiliated and ashamed deep inside, feeling all alone and isolated from God. Now, here, right now, before the cross on which is hung the salvation of the world, all those ugly things, the shame, the guilt, the remorse, is removed. Sin is taken away. For in his cross and by his death, the Lamb of God bore all our sin away and our shame. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. Now, my friends in Christ, here's the great news for you. That healing is for you this day. The wounds of Jesus are strength for you if you're weary, consolation if you're sorrowing, healing balm if you're the walking wounded. Thank God there is room at the cross for sinners who grieve and mourn their sin. Sinners who know their transgression, whose sin is ever before them. Sinners who know the bitter taste left over in their mouths from angry words they have spoken. Sinners whose lives are strewn with the wreckage of sin and the anguish of oh so much hurt. Sinners who feel in the bones, in their bones, the wretched refuse of foul and polluted thoughts, and who know the heft of the awful weight of shame and guilt that comes from sins of thought and word and deed. Now, in spite of what your life might look like right now, or what mine looks like right now. Your life and mine, they remain a good life in Jesus. The Lamb who died to save you, the one who bore your shame, for that is all done now, thanks be to God. After all, notice the thrust of each power-packed phrase in our text. He was pierced, crushed, his our punishment was upon him. All of that is now long past. The bitter agony, the bloody sweat, the suffering soul, the dying breath. All of that lies in the past, forever over and done. But the last and best part continues, now and lasts forever. And that is what is yours this very day. With his stripes, you are healed. Every last wounded heart and hurting soul can find its health restored today in the Savior once given into death that you might live. There is a cure for all that ails you in your sin-sick soul, in the words of Jesus. For they are spirit and they are life for you today. 
It is finished. It is accomplished. And you can take him at his word. Now is vanquished sin and death and hell. Now the whole ugly record of our sin and all its shame is set aside, nailed with Jesus on his cross, done away with him in his death. Now the power of darkness is defeated and the fury of God's wrath is silenced. Now the fears that haunt us are dissolved. Now even the grave itself can never separate us from the love of God that is in Christ, his Son, our Lord. For Jesus is the Lamb of God, pure and holy, who bore our shame away. Therefore, in awestruck wonder, we pray this holy day. Have mercy on us, Jesus. Grant us your peace. Amen. And now the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in him forever. Amen. Please stand as we sing the hymn, The Lamb. Please be seated. As I mentioned, the bidding prayer is an ancient prayer of the church. And traditionally, it is divided between the assisting pastor or someone, and then, or the reader, and then the pastor says the prayer itself. So what I've done this year is the C that you see on the screen is the congregation. You'll be acting as the person asking and saying what we're going to pray about, and then I will have the prayer. But we'll say this. So you'll say the C part, and I'll say the P part, as we have always done. Let us... Almighty and everlasting God, 
since you have revealed your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. And in the word of his truth, keep us, we ask you, in safety the works of your mercy, so that your church, spread throughout all the nations, may be defended against the adversary and may serve you in true faith and persevere in the confession of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, receive the supplications and prayers which we offer before you, for all your servants in your holy church, that every member of the same may truly serve you according to your calling, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God and Father, because you always grant growth to your church, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that rejoicing in their new birth by water of the holy baptism, they may be forever continue in the family of those whom you adopt as your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. O merciful Father in heaven, because you hold in your hands all the might of man, and because you have ordained for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do well, all the powers that exist in all the nations of the world, we humbly pray you graciously to regard your servants, especially Justin Trudeau, our prime minister, all of our provincial and territorial legislatures, Scott Moe, our Premier, and all those who make, administer, and judge our laws, that all who receive the sword as your ministers may bear it according to your word, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty and everlasting God, the consolation of the sorrowful and the strength of the weak. May the power, may the prayers of those who are in any tribulation or distress cry to you, graciously come before you, so that in all their necessities they may rejoice in your manifold help and comfort. And here we remember all of in our midst who are ill. And we also remember Cesar and George Walter, that you would be with them in this time, that they may rejoice in your manifold help and comfort through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, because you seek not the death but the life of all, hear our prayers for all who have no right knowledge of you. And for the glory of your name, bring them into the fellowship of your holy church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty and everlasting God, King of glory and Lord of heaven and earth, by whose spirit all things are governed, by whose providence all things are ordered, the God of peace and the author of all concord, grant us, we implore you, your heavenly peace and concord, that we may serve you in true fear to the praise and glory of your name. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. O Almighty, everlasting God, through your only Son, our blessed Lord, you have commanded us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, and to pray for those who persecute us. We therefore earnestly implore you that by your gracious visitation, all our enemies may be led to true repentance and may have the same love and be of one accord and one mind and heart with us and with your whole Christian church, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, Father Almighty, by your word you created and you continue to bless and uphold all things. We pray you so to reveal to us your word, our Lord Jesus Christ, that through his dwelling in our hearts, we may, be, by your grace, be made ready to receive your blessing on all the fruits of the earth and whatsoever pertains to our bodily need. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power of the Lord, for ever. We hear the musical offertory. <laughs>
Another aspect of Good Friday is the reproaches. These are statements that God makes questioning in his righteous anger way what the people of Israel have done against him to warrant their behavior. Thus says the Lord, what have, what have I done to you, O my people? And wherein have I offended you? Answer me. For I have raised you up out of the prison house of sin and death, and you have delivered up your Redeemer to be scourged. For I have redeemed you from the house of bondage, and you have nailed your Savior to the cross. O my people. We join together in seeing Lamb of God, pure and holy. Please stand. Please be seated. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people? And wherein have I offended you? Answer me. For I have conquered all your foes, and you have given me over and delivered me to those who persecute me. For I have fed you with my word and refreshed you with living water, and you have given me gall and vinegar to drink. O my people, You may remain seated as we sing the next verse of Lamb of God.
Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people? And wherein have I offended you? Answer me. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? My people, is this how you thank your God? O oh, my people. Please remain seated as we sing the next verse of Lamb of God. Adore you, O Lord, and we praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For behold, by the wood of your cross, joy has come into all the world. God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us and have mercy upon us. We adore you, O Lord, and we praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For behold, by the wood of your cross, joy has come into all the world. Let us pray. We implore you, O Lord, that your abundant blessing may be upon your people who have held the passion and death of your Son in devout remembrance, that we may receive your pardon and the gift of your comfort, and may increase in faith and take hold of eternal salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Just before we conclude with our next hymn, just a word about how we'll proceed or recess out of the sanctuary. After the hymn is over, you'll note that there's no benediction. That's part of keeping with the death of Christ. However, we'll ask you to leave in silence, and I'm not sure who we're following out this morning. Is it, sorry? Oh, Renata Bishop. Please follow Renata out, and we'll recess in silence. Please stand as we sing our closing hymn. 